Welcome and good afternoon, everybody. I am really excited to join you today to talk about some of my own work in the analysis of developing statistical methods and software for the analysis of single cell RNA sequencing data. I believe I posted my slides online. It was late last night. Should be available at stephaniehicks.com slash talks. If it's not, just ping me and I'll make sure to post the slides afterwards. And I know the, the recording will also be made available on YouTube for those that um, want to follow it later. So um, I'm going to talk about single cell RNA sequencing. And I thought I would begin with just a brief introduction to those data. If you are not familiar with it, I've been told that the audience is made up of um, mathematicians, data scientists, and biologists, so quite a diverse group. So I thought I would just briefly cover that first. So the traditional way that people have measured gene expression data is something called bulk RNA sequencing. And for a given gene, you get to see the average of expression across all cell types. You take a piece of tissue from my skin or my brain, and for a given feature, for a given gene, you just get to see the average expression across all the cells in that tissue. You don't actually get to see what the cell types are. And an analogy I like to use are Legos. Um, imagine you have a big pile of Legos, and for a given feature, such as the width of each Lego, you get to see an average of widths across all the Legos in the pile. Now, there are newer-ish technologies, it's really like 10 years now, so it's not so new, um, that allow you to capture expression in an individual cell, and that's why we call it single cell um, gene expression, or single cell RNA sequencing is the technology that we use. Um, and so here, the analogy would be we get to take our big pile of Legos and we get to group them by size, color, and type. And we get to see essentially the different types of Legos that exist in our pile. We get to see potentially like the amount of composition of each cell type. Um, but the real beauty is that we get to see a feature, a gene expressed in an individual cell, which is really phenomenal um, advancement in technologies. So a little bit more formally, single cell RNA sequencing is the process where we take a particular tissue, such as a brain tumor, we disassociate those cells, we separate them into little aliquots or isolate them, and we sequence them individually. There are a lot of um, tricks behind that, uh, but essentially we're sequencing them individually. And then at the end of the sequencing experiment, we get a set of sequencing reads that come out of what are called FASTQ files. And each one of those reads is represented by a black line in the top right corner. And what we do is we basically do a, a matching algorithm and we try to figure out where the read came from in a given genome, for example, the human genome or the human transcriptome. And so for a given cell, a given observation, and a given gene, a given feature, we get to see essentially the number of reads that map to a given gene in a given cell. So if I did my math right, there should be 18 little lines there. And so in the, um, the matrix there at the bottom left, for a given gene in a given cell, we record the number 18, which represents 18 reads um, or something called UMIs, unique molecular identifiers, that map to a given gene in a given cell. Now this matrix that we record is actually quite sparse for single cells. So a given cell it might not be expressing many genes. It might be expressing a handful of genes. It might be expressing lots of genes, depending on what it's doing at the given point of sequencing. Um, but in general, this matrix is very sparse, meaning that it has a lot of zeros. What do we do with that matrix? Oh, so many things. We can, for example, just plot expression. We can say for a given set of cells, I want to plot a certain set of genes and I want to see um, genes that are upregulated in certain cells and not regulated or up downregulated in other cells. We can also do things like discover cell types. So we can apply things like unsupervised algorithms such as principal components analysis. And we can um, see if individual cells separate out in PCA space. If you want to know more about open challenges in single cell data science, I point you to a review that I was a part of um, called 11 Grand Challenges in Single Cell Data Science. I will point out that there are challenges 
in both single cell transcriptomics, which is what I'm gonna focus on today, but there are also challenges in single cell genomics, um, phylogenomics, and then we, we have these things called overarching challenges if you're interested. Um, but if you're looking to learn more about kind of some open questions, I encourage you to start there. All right, so I love gifts. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with a gift. Um, one of the, the comments that I get whenever I start to talk to people about the analysis of single cell data is they are really excited. I have some awesome single cell RNA sequencing and I wanna analyze it. One of the things I hear most recently um, quickly followed up by that is that it's so big, I don't even know where to begin. It's, um, it's sitting in some kind of file format and I don't really know how to get it into Python or get it into R um, or even load it into memory. And you may say, mm, how big of a problem is that? I'm not so sure. I mean, I've seen data sets with thousands of cells. Yes, those exist. Um, but I will point out that I pulled four papers. This is now, I guess, a little old from 2019. And they are um, four representative papers from a manually curated data set at their linked at the bottom from Valentin Svensson. And I highlight in red the number of observations per data set that each paper produced. As you can see, we are standardly producing as of 2019 data sets with a million plus cells. That's quite a few um, magnitudes bigger than just say a thousand cells that we're typically working with uh, when we started out with single cell RNA sequencing. And then this past fall in, in November 2020, Cole Trapnell and Jay Shinduri from the University of Washington, they teamed up to apply a um, single cell combinatorial indexing technique called SciRNA-seq, if you're familiar with it, to um, to sequence or to generate a human cell atlas of fetal gene expression. So 121 fetal samples across 15 organs profiling over 4 million cells. That was the data set that was produced from this um, paper. Most recently on the technology side, there has been there have been announcements from 10X Genomics, which is um, a well-known commercial platform for doing single cell or for generating single cell RNA-seq data. Um, they announced that standardly in 2022, they're going to be able to produce data sets with a million plus observations um, and growing. So we should be able to anticipate tens of millions of observations per data set, depending of course on what you start with, with your tissue um, and how many tissues you have, but that's really exciting. If I haven't convinced you yet, the Human Cell Atlas, a worldwide organization to essentially create a map of every cell in the human body, they produced a white paper in 2018 um, that said this comprehensive map as a first draft is going to produce a map or an atlas with at least 10 billion cells. Again, non-trivial, large amount of data. So um, coming at it from a statistical point of view or a computational point of view, one of the challenges that I like to focus on is how can we or how can we scale up our algorithms to be able to analyze millions, potentially billions of cells, because this is coming. Um, and as analysts, we need to be prepared to be able to be comfortable with working with really large data sets and have algorithms that can scale. So I'm gonna take a deep dive next on a project for clustering, but I'm also gonna then talk about a little bit about dimensionality reduction and some other projects that I've been working on in the area. Okay, so I mentioned um, clustering, for example, and scalability. So if we are going, what do we need to be able to do something like that? Well, first we're gonna need methods that use data disk. What do I mean by that? These are data file formats that you never actually load the data into memory. So a CSV file, when you load it into Python or R, you load the entire data set into memory. But there are file formats such as HDF5 and more recently ZAR or TileDB that allow you to essentially keep the data entirely stored on disk and then you just extract relevant portions of it when needed as you go through an algorithm. Um, why is this necessary? So for clustering, for example, we're gonna to need to be able to cluster full data matrices, potentially with millions of billions of cells by thousands of genes. And again, that doesn't fit into memory. And these file formats are being used by the human cell atlas that I pointed to before. So they are file formats that we as analysts are going to need to be comfortable with going forward. 
Um, what else do we need? We want these algorithms to be fast, of course. We're not going to be willing to wait for days for having a, um, an algorithm cluster 10 billion cells, for example. And we also potentially want to be able to cluster multiple times um, our data set with thousands to millions of cells, maybe in the principal component space with, say, the top 50 or 100 PCs, for example. And why would you want that? Um, the k-means algorithm is an example where we typically have to run k-means multiple times to figure out what is the choice of k that we want to use for our algorithm, for example. So we want to be able to do this many times and we want to do it fast. So I've talked a little bit about k-means clustering, so I'm going to focus on that. If you're not familiar with it, I will briefly highlight the ideas. Um, for a given set of n data points, x, and a chosen number, a user chosen number k, the k-means algorithm essentially partitions the data into k different clusters. And you can think about these as k different cell types, for example, that you're trying to discover. More formally, k-means is trying to minimize a particular criterion, the within, sets, um, within cluster sum of squares. And I wrote the criterion there, where x is our data matrix, mu i is the centroid for the kth cluster. In practice, the way we minimize that is we basically use an iterative algorithm based on two steps. One is for a given set of centroids, we start with either a random set of centroids or a well-picked set of centroids. We assign each observation to its closest centroid. And then given that we have an, a label or an assignment for all the observations, we then compute new centroids for a given cluster. We update the centroids depending on um, how many observations changed uh, in the first step. It's this very beautiful algorithm that's been used for many years now. Um, the problem with k-means is that one, the typical algorithms that are available to you, it requires all the data to be stored in memory. So first of all, you have to get all the data into memory. So if you have 10 million cells, you have to overcome that. Then the particular problem with k-means is that once you have the data loaded in memory, you also have to store all the pairwise distances between each observation and each centroid. So this can get very big. These matrices of pairwise distances can get very big as you scale up, as you can imagine. So um, I set out to try and develop a software package that would enable scalable clustering. And what I landed on was an algorithm called mini-batch k-means by, I think, Scott Scully in 2010. The idea of the mini-batch k-means algorithm is really simple. It's very similar to the k-means algorithm, except at each iteration, you're only using a random subset of data that you load into memory and you execute as part of the algorithm. And these um, random subsets, they're called mini-batches, hence mini-batch k-means. So what does this get you? One, you don't have to store the entire data set into memory. You only need to load into memory the subset of the data or the mini batch that you're using at any given point in the algorithm. And then of course the k centroids, but usually k is not that big. k might be like 25 or 30 or so. And then at each iteration, the real beauty is that you only need to compute the distances between each observation in your mini batch and the k centroids. That's very, um, that's a very significant reduction in amount of memory being used. For example, if you use a mini batch of say 1% of your data or 5% of your data, or it could be even absolute. You could say, I want to use only hundred observations in memory at a time. And then in this way, the use of mini batches makes it a very natural candidate for on data. On data as the HDFI file. If you want to know kind of a little bit more about what's going on underneath the hood, if for the mathematicians and the data analysts in the audience, it's actually performing stochastic gradient descent on this random subset of the data. Um, if you're not familiar, you can perform stochastic gradient descent on just one observation at a time for estimation. As you can imagine, that's a very um, fairly noisy procedure. And, it, and it's also um, the opposite. If you do stochastic gradient descent using all the data, 
at any given point, um, that's fairly memory intensive as I was hinting to before. So you can find this nice sweet spot where you're only using a small subset of observations that A, results in less noisy estimates than using one observation at a time, but much less memory intensive than using all the data at a time with um, significant increased speed. Of course, there's no need to store the data in memory. All right, so I started to look around for some existing implementations of this because it was very appealing to me. Um, there is a mini batch k means algorithm in the cluster R CRAN package. Turns out the data um, input type is a numeric matrix type. If you're not familiar with what that means, uh, basically you have to load the data into memory to have it run. So all of these nice file formats that I want to be able to use are not possible with the CRAN package, for example, or the, the cluster R CRAN package. There are also, um, there's also an implementation in Python via scikit-learn, and um, the input data can actually be stored in an HDFI file, so that was really exciting to me. However, when you go to execute the, the mini-batch k-means algorithm, it actually re realizes the full matrix into memory, um, and so that was, that was unfortunate. But if you're interested in trying it out, um, you can for example, from R, you can also use the reticulate package in R to be able to um, interact with Python code um, very easily. So we set out, uh, my collaborators and I set out to write our own implementation of the mini batch k-means algorithm inside the bioconductor framework. We called it mbk-means. The goal here is basically to enable people who are using k-means and whatever tool or whatever algorithm that they're using, it's widely used in many applications outside of genomics. As a, so we want to be able to take MBK means and essentially replace it for k-means wherever it's being used to enable more scalable clustering. Um, the input the input data can be of any matrix like objects. It can be an in, in memory data format or it can be an HDF5 file. Um, if you're familiar with bioconductor, it can be delayed matrix object. Um, it also provides all the nice functionality that you get from single cell experiment objects. If you're familiar with the, the bioconductor ecosystem for doing data analysis in single cell. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how fast it is and the memory usage. So we started out with a real single cell RNA-seq data set of 1.3 million neurons, and we downsampled to data sets of size 75,000 to a million. And those are the, the observations on the x-axis there um, from observations of data set sizes 75 to a million. On the left, we're reporting the max memory used in gigabytes. And on the, the right, we're reporting the time needed to run the algorithm for three different algorithms, k-means in red, mbk-means with data stored in memory in green, and then mbk-means with data stored on disk in blue. And as you can see, uh, k-means is very memory intensive, <laughs> very fast as you start to get data sets in above around 100,000 or so. Um, and it also can also be quite slow. And again, it's because you have to compute these pairwise distances between every observation in the centroid. In contrast, if you're willing to just use MBK means as a simple replacement, even with storing the data in memory, you don't wanna deal with the HDF5 for file formats. You have significant savings in both memory usage and in time to just simply replace K means with MBK means as a function in R, for example. Now, the real beauty is if you want to leverage on-disk data formats, such as HDF5, you can cluster a million cells in um, under 10 minutes with less than two gigabytes of memory. And that is pretty phenomenal, <laughs> considering um, the, the simplicity and the beauty of the algorithm behind it. And there's no reason why you couldn't be able to use mini batch k-means outside of single cell analysis anywhere you can um, is anything, you can essentially replace MBK means, um, you can replace K means with MBK means, but our motivation was for single cell data. 
I haven't talked about accuracy. So whenever we talk about scalability of algorithms, there's usually some trade-off between accuracy and speed, for example. And the thing I want to highlight here is that mini batch k-means is just as accurate as k-means for a given batch size. So you can imagine, I've kind of hinted at this, ran this choice of a random subset of data or the batch. That affects the accuracy. So on the x-axis now, I'm showing you absolute batch sizes. So batch sizes of data or um, batch sizes of say um, 75 observations to 1,000 observations for data sets um, of size 5,000, 10,000, and 25,000 going from left to right. And these are again um, down sampled data sets. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you the within cluster sum of squares criterion, which is typically used as a, a metric for um, accuracy. In red is k-means. You see that it does not change as a function of batch size, as it should not. <laughs> in blue and in green, mini batch k-means essentially is as accurate as k-means for a batch size of about 100, regardless of the data set size. So you can guarantee these really fast um, and really fast and memory, not memory intensive algorithm with just as accurate um, classification or clustering as k-means for a given batch size. So that was really nice to see. Now we also applied mini batch k-means on the full 1.3 million mouse brains that I, mouse brain cells that I refer to. This is actually a bioconductor package if you're interested in trying it out, 10x brain data. On the left, I'm showing you the low dimensional representation in UMAP space after applying um, PCA on the top 50, uh, for the, with the top 50 PCs. And then we clustered by the um, output from mini batch k-means. And I'm showing you um, the image with the Shex package. When you start to plot a lot of observations, I, I just want to give a highlight or shout out to Saskia Freitag's Shex package. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm really sorry, Saskia. But it's little um, bins that and you can choose um, uh, what colors to plot depending on how many observations are in each bin. But it prevents overplotting. It's a very nice um, type of plot for overplotting. OK, so we compared mini batch k-means to some state-of-the-art algorithms. Um, I'll start out with mini batch k-means. We applied mbk-means on the top 50 PCs, and we performed clustering 16 different times to determine the right k. And in total, it took three minutes. In contrast, we compared it to two state-of-the-art um, tools, shared nearest neighbors plus Leuven clustering on the top 50 PCs and the bioconductor framework. That took a total of 35 minutes. And we also compared that to BBKN plus Leiden clustering in the SCAMP or Python framework. And that took a total of 48 minutes uh, for the 1.3 million neurons. So we are really fast and we're just as accurate as k-means. That was really exciting to see. If you want to know more about the algorithm itself, I encourage you to check out our PLOS computational biology uh, paper or the bioconductor package that's available online. OK, so I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about another area for scalable data science, that's scalable single cell data science, and that's dimensionality reduction. So this is um, an area that I've had a lot of fun collaborating with, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a package that we developed, a method that we developed for it. So whenever people perform dimensionality reduction, such as principal components analysis, that's a standard approach developed um, for bulk RNA sequencing, and it's widely, widely applied in single cell RNA sequencing, is first they typically start out with some kind of transformation of the data. And there are, usually, there are lots of reasons for that, variant stabilization, if you're familiar with that, um, and then some kind of um, for using something kind of like a log transformation. Um, and the reason that we use these methods, um, such as PCA, is that they're really designed, or the reason that we do these transformations um, before we apply PCA is that these PCA, for example, was designed for normal or Gaussian looking data. I'm showing you an example of a gene. Um, this, this is UMI. So I think it's 10 genomics data for a given gene in a 
negative control data set. It's a set of monocytes where we expect no biological variation between the observations. And I'm showing you the expression for one gene across all the cells in the data set. Um, and so I'm going to next talk a little bit about how the current approaches that are applied for normalization and transformation can artificially distort differences uh, between zero counts, so that bar there on the left, and then the rest of the counts. So a standard transformation that people apply to single cell RNA-seq data is a something called counts per million. That's the second plot. It's scaling by some um, size factor, and then it applies um, a product of a million. And then after that, after applying the counts per million transformation, another standard transformation is the uh, using the log transformation shown there in the right. So what do you see? As you go from left to right, you see the counts that are zero remain zero. And then the counts that are non-zero start to shift away slowly from the zero bar in this um, plot. And what people have done is they basically say, oh, the thing there on the right is Gaussian looking, so therefore I'm going to apply PCA. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is just an example of a standard transformation that people have used in single cell. So whenever you apply PCA to this negative control data set, what you get are these strange kind of like elongated shapes often along PC1 or PC2 that are essentially driven by the, the number of zeros that are reported or observed in each cell or the fraction of zeros in each cell. This is also highly related to library size. And now if you recall, I mentioned this is negative control data, monocytes where we expect no biological variation between them. So we expect to see a big cluster without any elongated or shapes in our PCA space. And I plotted each point here, which is one cell, by the fraction of zeros that are reported for each cell. And you can kind of see PC1 is highly related to that. So um, instead of applying these transformations, um, log CPM, for example, Another way or an alternative approach is to try and directly model the count nature of these data. So gene expression via single cell RNA sequencing or bulk RNA sequencing are counts. Um, you record the number of reads that map to a given gene in a given cell or the number of UMIs that map or that come from a given gene in a given cell. These are non-negative integers. Um, so what we did is we took this negative control data set and we fit um, the, the log of the mean expression for a given gene against the fraction of zeros. So the, the mean expression is on the x-axis and the fraction of zeros is on the y-axis. Um, and then we plot three different count distributions, the multinomial, the Poisson, and the negative binomial. And we see that they're all really good fits for this negative control data set where we don't expect any biological variation in them. Um, I'll point out that this has been highlighted in other papers as well, that um, data that you don't expect any biological variation have been, uh, or these models are really good fits for the error distributions to model these data. So our idea was to try and extend PCA for non-Gaussian data or count data, for example. So I apologize that I meant to make this more interactive and cover over the bottom half and walk you through it slowly, uh, but I ran out of time. Okay, so let's imagine we have YIJ as just raw observed UMI counts for cell I and gene J, and then ZI as the normalized and the transformed version of YI, such as um, centered and scaled log counts per million or Z-scores. So there at the top, if we talk about the PCA um, objective function, it can be written as the minimization of um, the mean squared error between our data, zi, and some low rank representation, u and v, where the uis are the factors of the principal components and the vjs are the loadings. And they belong to some um, space rl, for example. And the number of latent dimensions l, of course, controls the complexity of the model. Now, 
of the, the mean squared error there at the top is equivalent to minimizing the Euclidean distance between the embedding um, and the data. And so it can also be equivalent to maximizing a likelihood of a Gaussian model, which is what I'm showing you there in the middle equation, ZI um, distributed as a normal uh, UV with some um, standard or some variant sigma squared. Now, if we just simply replace the Gaussian model with a Poisson model, which does approximate a multinomial model, we can directly model the UMI counts. Um, for example, in a very similar way to the using in the third line that we did in the second line, where NI are the total numbers of UMI counts for cell I, for example. And this is the idea behind a method called GLM PCA, or a generalized version of PCA for non um, Gaussian data. And our goal here is again to estimate these UV factors um, that I hinted at similar to PCA. So a little bit more formally, I mentioned why I are these observed counts for UMI for cell I and gene J. NI is the total number of UMI counts for cell I. Pi IJ are the unknown true proportion of relative abundances in cell I and gene J. We don't observe those. Um, and the idea behind GLM PCA is essentially to directly model the counts using a multinomial distribution or which can be approximated by a Poisson. Um, the multinomial model, if you know much about it, it is generally um, computationally intractable. And so that's why we use these, um, uh, these Poissons, which uh, are approximated, uh, with them, which the multinomial can be approximated by. And the idea here is to essentially parameterize the unknown relative abundance, pi ij, um, using a latent variable model for dimensionality reduction. And so we specifically have a latent variable for each cell and we use a simple GLM model with a log link, with a link function. Um, now that's pretty much what I'm gonna go into for the details here. I'll just highlight that this thing implicitly implies a normalization, but it's not a formal transformation that happens. It's just, um, it does implicitly apply one. Some problems with this approach, um, is that it's a non-convex optimization function. It's prone to local optima and numerical divergences. Um, and it can be incredibly slow computationally depending on the size. So uh, my collaborators and I came up with an approximate version of GLM PCA or we, yeah, GLM PCA. Um, so we know normalization has its own problems. And then these integrative models um, that I just, alluded to, they also have their own problems, such as numerical divergences sometimes. And I think personally, when I talk to biologists, they love PCA. <laughs> they understand PCA and they get it. Um, they don't have to install fancy packages and they don't have to wait for something to run. So any way that we can get the data as close as possible to quote unquote normalized so that they can run PCA is going to have a big impact with practitioners, in my opinion. Um, so if the goal is PCA, then PCA, as, I, as we all know, is a linear, is designed for Gaussian data. Um, it's a linear Gaussian model. And so we need to transform the data that we have to match this assumption. So another definition of normalization, normalization is essentially to make the errors look Gaussian, not the data itself, but the errors. Um, and so you can think about it as conditional in the biology. We want that extra technical variation to be normally distributed. So what we did is we come up, we came up with um, a null model for this noise only data looking at the negative control. And we, I showed you, we fit a model using the uh, multinomial, for example. And then we take the residuals after fitting um, a multinomial model per gene, for example. And then according to asymptotic theory, a GLM theory, asymptotically according to GLM theory, um, that should be approximately normal if the model is correct. But we feel kind of confident about that given this negative control data set that I showed you. So um, essentially what we're doing is we're calculating a set of residuals, whether it's devious, deviance residuals or Pearson residuals, um, and then from there, you can use these residuals in PCA, just like you would normally use PCA applied to our log transformed data. Except this is really 
and it's convenient and it's interpretable. So let me go back to this plot that I showed you before. Again, these are negative control data where we don't expect any um, changes. We don't expect to see any structure in our PCA space. When we apply GLM PCA, we see that that artifact due to the fraction of zeros is mostly removed. Um, if you want to know more about the paper itself, if I haven't convinced you yet um, to use it, uh, check out our genome biology paper. Um, it was led by a now postdoc with Barbara Englehart, Will Towns. Um, he was with me during my postdoc with Rafael Rosari. It was a really great, fun collaboration to, to work with him on. There's an R package that's available just on CRAN because, as you can imagine, GLM PCA can be designed for data outside of genomics, any kind of non normal looking data that are counts, for example. Um, and I will say that there have been recent updates to the package, specifically being able to calculate gradients using mini batches that I've had a lot of fun with uh, working with Bilan. So we've been working on making this package more scalable for larger and larger data using the similar strategy that I used for mini batch k-means to make it more scalable. I will also mention that if you're wanting to have a package inside a bioconductor, there's a package called scry. Don't ask me what scry means. I still don't think there's an actual meaning behind it. It's just a meaningless name for single cell that we thought was fun. Um, that allows you to essentially have a wrapper around the CRAN package, GLM PCA, but all of the nice functionality for the, the bioconductor ecosystem to work with single cell experiment objects. It works with HDF5 files, it works with delayed array objects, so it's very scalable as you go forward. And here is where the approximate GLM uh, PCA implementation sits inside of Scry. And I heard that there are data scientists in the audience. So I thought um, for anybody who would just quickly want to know how to kind of put this all together, I thought I would give like a really brief demo um, inside of the bioconductor framework. So I picked out a data set with 4,000 cells. Um, it's a PBMC data set. And you'll see that there is an assay called counts. So these are the I referred to this matrix at the very beginning, a count matrix uh, with a set of genes and a given set of cells. That's the count matrix, the raw count matrix for, um, I think it's 10x data. So you can extract this object very easily using the counts function. It's a single cell experiment object. So you have along the rows are the genes and along the columns are the cells and they're around 4,300 cells. The thing I want to highlight, though, is that this is not just a normal matrix. This is what's called a delayed matrix. It's a very special, special matrix that makes you feel like you're looking and you're working with an actual matrix loaded into memory. But in reality, the data are entirely stored on disk and you haven't loaded the data into memory yet. And so it's very fast to work with because it produces these um, functions that make you feel like you're working with them in a very nice and interactive way. Um, and if you look under the hood, that's essentially an HDF5 file. And so I wanted to give you an example of what it's like to work with an HDF5 file kind of in this demo. I'm going to skip over some steps that we did not show here. So we removed some low quality cells, we removed some lowly expressed genes, um, and then we um, did an normalization by first clustering all the genes using all the cells with mini batch k-means, following by scran normalization, which is a standard normalization applied for um, single cell data. So if we do that, um, what we get, uh, we compute the first 50 principal components using the top highly variable genes um, using log two transformed data. And so there I'm showing you um, each cell is a dot and the color represents the cluster from mini batch k-means. And I'm showing you PC1 and PC2. Now, if you wanna know more about um, why again these sh the shapes there are kind of long and, and elongated. Um, I just point you to two papers again, the the Will Towns paper or a paper where I talked about a little bit this a little bit of this in um, in a biostatistics paper. Um, so again, we see like these kind of like long gated shapes that are highly correlated with the fraction of zeros for each cell um, and how that correlates with PC. 
So an alternative PCA is to use GLM PCA, like I've talked about before, implemented in the SCRI package. And I wanna highlight that we're using the fast approximate version. So what we do is we first calculate a set of residuals. It's the function null residuals, and we're using the deviance residuals specifically. And from there, what we do is we just pipe it directly into PCA. And you work with the low dimensional representations that you get from um, PCA, just like you would we work with the low dimensional GLM PCA components just like you would PCA. Um, and so I'm gonna focus on GLM PCA for the rest of the demo. We then take the low dimensional representation that we get from GLM PCA and we build um, a shared nearest neighbor graph and apply Leuven clustering. I'm showing you there on the right what the clusters look like using state-of-the-art clustering from Leuven, for example. And you can also do the same thing with mini batch k-means. You can take the GLM PCA components, apply mini batch k-means from five from k equals five to k equals twenty, compute some kind of elbow plot, and quickly get a set of clusters with mini batch k-means, um, which again is faster than k-means. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go back into the, all the details about mini batch k-means. Um, but it was really nice to just like kind of see this all kind of come together. And I wanted to show you how it can be the two packages that I've talked about thus far can be integrated together to get a set of clusters that are hopefully less biased um, than what you're typically used to seeing with PCA. All right. So in the last few minutes of the talk, I want to focus on um, two other challenges kind of briefly. One oh, is actually so before you move on, we did have a question. I was going to save it till the end, but oh, um, yeah, go for it. Sorry, si Simon uh, might be able to say himself actually because my dog's going. Uh, sorry, I was just um to do with the counts when you're talking about counts and then counts per million and then the sort of log. Bit. Yes, it, is that because in single cell data you've got a lot less than a million counts per? Um, per cell. Yes, you typically, so in particular um, for 10x or data that have UMI barcodes, you definitely have a lot less than a million uh, counts per cell. Mm -hmm. um, that's just a standard transformation that was basically pulled over from the development of methods for bulk RNA sequencing. And that's what people standardly applied to the analysis of single cell data for a really long time and still do to a certain extent. Sometimes they multiply instead of by a million, it could be like 10,000. But it, the idea is very similar. You do some kind of standardization um, or some kind of transformation with the dividing by the library sizes and um, applying some kind of scaling factor, maybe 10,000, and then applying a log transformation with a pseudo count of one, for example. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a hangover from bulk RNA. Seeks. Oh, yes, yeah, that, sorry, I could have just said that. <laughs> yeah, which, which I'm familiar with, but not single cell. So thank you. It's a hangover from bulk, yeah. All right, thank you for the question. Um, so if you're in the audience and you're wanting to learn about the analysis of single cell data, you may have experienced this feeling before um, where you feel like you kind of don't know where to begin. There are some really great tools out there. I want to just highlight one that I'm, I have spent a lot of time on, and that's working in the bioconductor, our bioconductor ecosystem. Um, so I wrote this paper specifically to address that feeling for anybody who's feeling that in the audience right now. I was also feeling that whenever I started working in single cell analysis that there were a lot of packages that had been developed very quickly and it wasn't super clear to me kind of how to put it all together and have complete workflows that a user who has either generating data or a bioinformatician or a data analyst who's starting to analyze these data where, where to begin um, and what are the state-of-the-art tools, for example, or state-of-the-art packages within Bioconductor to be able to analyze my data from raw counts all the way to um, producing very nice reports for collaborators, for example. So I point you to this packet or this paper called Orchestrating Single Cell Analysis with Bioconductor. Inside of it, we talk about a couple of things. Um, for example, we talk about how to standardize or some standardized ways to store single cell 
called a single cell experiment object or using a single cell experiment class. The reason that we encourage users to use this class is that um, many, many packages in Bioconductor all use the same object. And it's really nice because this object can be um, piped into one package, done, do something to it, such as calculate um, clusters, and then or ca calculate GLM PCA components, spit it back out, and then it's still a single cell experiment object. And then it can be piped into, say, for example, mini batch key means. And you can get the cluster labels for mini batch key means. There's no um, reformatting the data for every different package. It's all interoperable and it allows modularity of the bioconductor ecosystem. So we talk about why that's really important. We talk about these workflows that I alluded to, starting with um, experimental design and pre-processing and quality control all the way through clustering and differential expression um, and producing really nice reports. The real beauty and the thing I'm most proud of is a online book that was a corresponding book with the manuscript called Orchestrating Single Cell Analysis in Bioconductor. It contains um, many different things. For example, it contains lots of philosophical discussions about single cell data analyses that you as a user might be interested in, such as one that I often get is, what are the true number of clusters in my data? I love that question. Um, and I get that asked a lot. So I thought I would we, we would put that down. But it basically talks or walks you through step by step how to leverage um, state of the art bioconductor packages for the analysis of single cell. And the real exciting part is it includes lots of code. So if you just essentially want to take the code, copy and paste it for your own data analysis, it's very easy to do that, especially if you've got your data formatted in a single cell experiment object. Um, all right. And so in the last part of the talk, I just want to say I have been focusing a lot on single cell data um, up until now. That was in the title of my talk. But I would be remiss if I didn't touch on a really exciting technological development that's happened kind of within the last few years. So I've talked about bulk RNA sequencing on the left and single cell RNA sequencing on the right. There are some advances in technology that now allow us to capture expression in a spatial or a 2D plane, if you're familiar um, with this. And this is really useful for a variety of reasons. You can imagine, for example, if you're looking at tumor cells um, in, or if you're looking at tumor tissue, you can now, for example, say, ah, here's a set of tumor cells and here are a set of say immune cells, and I can now see in a 2D plane that they are sitting in a local space next to each other. And then I can ask, how are they communicating versus a set of tumor cells that don't have a set of immune cells around it, for example. Um, and soon we're gonna be able to um, essentially reconstruct organs in a 3D plane or maybe in a 4D plane uh, setting across time. And so as you start, as we start to generate these data, which are really, really exciting, um, an important set of questions are, okay, how do we begin to make sense of these data? Can we just take the methods that were applied for single cell and kind of throw them at the spatial technologies that are now coming on board, similar to the way we took the bulk RNA seq methods and threw them at single cell. Um, so there are lots of different technologies that have come online, especially in the last year or two. They're really hitting their stride. Murfish, if you're familiar with it, SlideSeq, Visium um, from 10X Genomics, Nature Methods, 20, um, the, the, the journal Nature Methods, they titled Spatially Resolved Transcriptomics as the 2020 method of the year. Um, these data are, I think, here to stay for quite some time and are going to be really well developed. And so with these new technologies comes lots of interesting problems or opportunities, if you'd like to think of it that way. Some questions um, you might think about are, if I take this frozen, a fresh frozen mouse brain, from the 10X Visium platform. This was published online in um, December, 2019. It's like 
half a hand tiny little slice of an offering that's been put into the 2D plane. Um, you can see that there are tiny little circles there. This is a barcoding technology, and you essentially get to see um, RNA expression in each one of these little circle dots. So now I've got some observations, which are these little circles with, again, potentially up to um, 20,000 features if I'm looking at human brain, for example. And you may, but I also have like these spatial coordinates in the XY plane. So you could ask, how do I store these data? How do I access these new data type in, a, in a, a way that's accessible using these spatial coordinates? Should these spatial coordinates be tacked on as additional features? Should they be um, interacted with in a standardized way for people who are going to develop packages? So it's all um, modular and interoperable, similar to the single cell experiment. You could ask, how do I do quality control and normalization? So certain, obs or certain observations on this mouse brain are going to have more RNA than other observations. And that's biologically meaningful um, because there just will be more RNA content developed or expressed in certain cell types versus other cell types. And a standard assumption in bulk RNA sequencing, which was commonly applied to single cell, is that there should be um, that should be normalized away. There should be no differences essentially in the total amount of RNA. So basic QC metrics come up as questionable now when you start to think about these spatial technologies. Also certain observations are gonna have, for example here, they're gonna have multiple cells per spot. And then other observations or other little barcodes are gonna have potentially no cells per spot, depending on um, the density of this, the cellular density of their particular tissue. How do we do modeling? Um, how do we, for example, take spatial replicates from a healthy brain and compare that to a brain that's affected by a disease such as Alzheimer's? How do we um, ask, are there differences across particular regions of the brains in healthy versus control? How do we align these replicates that we potentially get um, from these particular tissues? How do we do clustering with spatial data? Can we just apply k-means or mini-batch k-means and ignore this, the xy coordinate information? Or do we tack it on to the features and just kind of naively use it? Or do we do something more clever using Gaussian processes, for example, leveraging the rich world of spatial statistics? So I'm going to focus on just one of these questions uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor. Um, and that's how to store and access these data. This is something that I'm really passionate about because I want the developers to get behind one object so we're not developing different objects from the very beginning to make um, this data infrastructure really easy to work with. So I showed you the, I talked a little bit about the single cell experiment class. If you wanna know more about it, go check out the paper. Um, essentially, it uh, leverages or extends something called a summarized experiment object. We recently developed a spatial experiment class that basically extends the single cell experiment object. And it's very similar to the single cell experiment class, except it now has these additional assays, um, specifically cord or storing the spatial coordinates. It has its own slot. And then also the images. So I haven't really talked about this, but the, all the spatial barcode data, for example, come with these histological images. And you can ask, where do I store these images? How do I keep it tied together with the count data? Um, I'm giving you a quick highlight of kind of two examples that of two different technologies. So in the left, I'm showing you spot-based data set from 10X Visium platform from the human dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The different dots are the different observations and they're colored by a ground truth. This was a scientist who manually annotated these six layers plus white matter. It's very painstaking. Um, in contrast, on the right, I'm showing you a molecule-based data set from the SeekFish platform from mouse embryo. Um, and the color scale shows the total amount of RNA contents per cell for the SOX2 gene. Um, so you can start to use these data in a really easy way in Bioconductor with the spatial experiment package um, and start to visualize it with a package called GGSpotViz developed by my postdoc, Lucas Weber, if you're interested. There's a preprint that's available online if you want to know more about the spatial experiment object, and we're hoping to have it. 
soon. Um, and I will stop there. My, it's the end of the hour. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of the co-authors on the orchestrating single cell package or um, book and the, the paper, and also the bioconductor developers who developed the packages themselves. Will Towns led the GLM PCA project. Um, I and my collaborators, Debbie Day Rousseau uh, and Elizabeth Purdom led the mini batch k-means project. And Daria Regali, Lucas Weber, and Helena Kroll uh, co-led the spatial experiment um, package that I, I briefly talked about there at the end. Thank you to all the funders and thank you so much for your time and listening to this talk. Brilliant, thank you very much, Stephanie. That was that was really great. Um, I guess if you're if you don't have to rush off straight away, we have maybe a, a, a bit of time for some questions. Uh, but obviously, yes. if you if, if you do have to head off now, or if no, no, I have some time. Uh, if some of you in the audience do, then then obviously Stephanie just did have a contact details with the few. Oh, we've got a question already, uh, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. That was a great talk. Um, I was wondering about your mini batches. When you pick your mini batch, do you stick with it and work with it throughout, or have you explored? taking different mini batches over and over and maybe watching the centroids move around a bit with the different mini batches and then taking the mean of those centroids or something like that. So you go back to your, your results vary on which mini batch you pick. So we have looked, we've done a simulations and analyses um, increasing the mini batch for both accuracy and for memory and time. Um, I showed you for a fixed mini batch memory and time, but we've also looked at what happens if you um, in, change the mini batch. Accuracy is essentially the thing um, that is most affected. And I, we, um, but there is a slight change in the performance of time and memory as you get to a batch size of around 10,000. Um, we haven't done an analysis where you are say for a given batch size, repeat k-means 100 times. Um, I don't know, I guess we did because we plot, for example, accuracy with standard error bars. Um, so we did do that. And there are error bars in the manuscript um, as we, for example, show different absolute batch sizes. We repeat the analysis 100 times and show error bars. In certain cases, like memory usage, they're essentially zero. The memory usage doesn't really change. The time can change a little bit, especially for k-means. Um, as you repeat the analysis several times, um, but many batch k-means, I don't recall changing very much. Okay, thanks. So, but it reminds me of machine learning where you do. Um, say leave 10% out, but you do that 10 times to ensure every single um, data point is used. Oh, every data point is used over the course of the algorithm. So what you do is you load in 1% of the data, for example, estimate the centroids, throw that 1% out, and yeah. then load in another 1%. And at the end, when you have, and so each iteration, the centroids are updated. And then at oh, yeah, the very yeah. end of the algorithm, um, you have these final centroids. There's one classification, one final classification step using the final centroids. Did that answer oh. your question? Yes, that's exactly what the kind of thing I was thinking of. Thanks. Okay. Um, I have one other quick question. Um, with your negative data set using monocytes, yes. um, they can differentiate into dendritic cells. So do you do some sort of quality control if that ever happens? Do you see that with a different cluster or something like that? Yeah, so this is the problem with single cell. <laughs> it's about the closest you're going to get to real single cell RNA-seq data set, unless there, there are data sets that have essentially um, dropped, they manually dropped in the same content into individual little aliquots, and then they sequence them individually. That's like a real negative control data set. Um, with that was also used in the paper as well. Um, Valentin Svensson actually wrote a blog post showing that droplet-based single-cell RNA-seq data are not zero-inflated, and he um, used these data sets to prove the point. It's not real single-cell RNA-seq data, and so that was the closest that we could get to a real cell, uh, an actual monocyte, but you're right that there could be potentially biological differences. Um, but we also, I just want to state and emphasize that we showed this with the little spiked in RNA-seq droplets um, and found the same thing, that the distributions, multinomial, Poisson, negative binomial are really good fits to the data to model the technical distribution or the
yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I guess that's the best you can do. <laughs> um, it's always a problem, it, even with, without differentiation, you can get some kind of symmetry breaking where the population of cells. They... I agree. Yeah. Um, there are different data sets that we tried, but this is the closest thing that we could get using real yeah. single cell data. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you for the question, Andrew. Uh, I had a really probably naive statistical question. When you when you were at, at showing the k-means algorithm results, um, as your um, overall data set size increased, you were getting sort of more better accuracy for the same batch size. And I guess I didn't I can intuitively work out why that how that works. I thought you'd have a sort of smaller relative sample. Oh uh, yes, let me bring it up. I'll talk you through sorry, it. Sorry, I'll be I'll be two seconds. Sorry. This is where you're oh sorry. I'll wait for him to come back. Maybe um Stephanie, maybe until Carl comes back so we can answer that question. Can I ask quickly that I mean the scalability issue of clustering, um, did you you have any thoughts on the other essays like more binary single cell ataxic, where you have more serious issues with the read depth and um, those kind of artifacts leading to clusters, kind of wrong clusters? Right. So count data are a particular type of non Gaussian data. Binary data are another type of non Gaussian data. So they're also going to have similar issues. And you can imagine extending PCA, um, or the, the PCA algorithm for binomial data as well, or Bernoulli data, um, essentially. And it will be affected again if you apply standard transformations that were developed for bulk um, attack seek, for example, and then apply PCA kind of naively. It's going to have the same sorts of problems um, that uh, that the single cell RNA seq world has kind of grappled with. Um, I haven't worked so much with the attack seek, but I can imagine that it's a very similar phenomenon. So. I don't want to speak too much about it. I know there are some really great packages that have been developed, like Snap Snap Attack, um, that people are using. That I'm starting to learn about. Uh, my collaborators are starting to generate some multi-ohm 10x data, um, and so I'm starting to learn about this. <laughs> okay, Carl. So I just wanted to. I think this is the slide that you were asking about. That's right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea here is we fix the number of observations, say on the left, for 5,000. And then on the y-axis, I'm showing you increasing numbers of batch sizes. So if I load in 75 observations into memory at a time at each point in the algorithm versus 1,000 observations into memory at a time, I'm showing you the within cluster sum of squares with error bars. So we repeated this, I think, 100 times. Um, and you can see that the within cluster sum of squares are larger. They are just noisier estimates. Um, the, or there's a noisier per performance. This is a noisier performance metric for um, smaller batch sizes versus larger batch sizes. You can do this like with one observation technically. Um, you load in one observation, you estimate the centroid. Um, it's just, it's gonna like hop around quite a bit uh, as opposed to having more data into memory because then you potentially are getting um, capturing cells from different clusters. So you get a better sense of kind of the structure in the data set with a larger batch size, but it just quickly becomes a problem. Um, well, I guess for mini batch k-means, it's not really a problem until about 10,000. That's what we found with our analyses. If you get above 10,000, then there starts to be a hit in terms of um, memory usage and time. Um, oh, that's great, yeah. I, I guess I hadn't noticed the I didn't notice the y axis changing, but yeah, of course they're they essentially different problems you're solving as you increase the data size. So yeah, I, that's uh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. The thing right, that's so. important is that it's there's no difference between k means and mini batch k means. I guess that's the point I wanted to state that you get like these huge benefits and memory and time usage if you're willing to like use a thousand observations or five hundred observations specifically. Um, so, yeah, great. Uh, 
I'll stop recording now, but thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for um, that talk and answering all our questions. Um,